Minecraft is not a sandbox game. Minecraft is a morality game. It is a game that reveals our true nature. It is a game where you can spend your entire year in complete solitude planting vegetables or be an absolute agent of chaos adopting a reverse vegan diet. In this video, I will be attempting to survive 100 days of Minecraft in the evilest way possible. I began my conquest by murdering every animal in sight. I found sea turtles, googled to ensure that they were an endangered species, and then killed them upon confirmation. I fell down this hole in the mountain, met this skeleton, and in abusive relationship fashion, gaslighting him into thinking that his attacks were hurting himself. I crafted iron tools and explored further into the cave, making sure to harvest whatever iron I found so they would be useful for torturing lives later. I found the spider spawner and jotted it down on paper. This could be potentially useful later. I made a declaration. I was only going to eat food made from materials that I stole or materials that I got from killing. These zombified human rights activists weren't too happy about my declaration. But my evil potentials far away they are beyond the grave activism. There were also beehives in the path of my searching. I formulated a math equation as to how many lives would be affected if I were to break a single beehive. The lack of pollination would lead to a drastically lower supply of food for every animal nearby. Thus, I made sure to break every beehive in sight as well. And the thought of all those lives suffering because of my actions energized me throughout the night. In the morning of day 3, I killed bees angry at me destroying their home. Found the village in the mountains. I have concluded that the village was too hard for me to torture due to its terrain. And thus, I have decided to end their free trial of existing. I started by individually stepping on every part of the farm, absolutely decimating their food supply. I began burning houses with lava. After setting everything on fire, I left the village. As sunrise came about, I found another village not too far off. I declared that the village was under my ruling from today onwards. I stored all the resources that I've either harvested or stolen from other people. I then went on to steal all of the resources from the village. I woke up the next morning and crafted a hole to more efficiently steal wheat from the village. I began clearing up the area, chopping down trees with no intentions of planting them back. Because I've googled the negative consequences of deforestation and found its effects to be satisfactory evil. Then I started a cocaine plantation and went to sleep knowing that it was only a matter of time before I plunged the village into an opioid epidemic. The villagers were more afraid of me in the next day. Except this nitwit. He never showed any fear. He knew he was never going to be enslaved since he could never get a job like the other villagers. He began mocking me, taunting me, flaunting his stupidity in my face. So I jotted his name down onto the list of people that I torture and kill with priority. I then spent the rest of the day creating a nether portal in the center of the village, symbolizing that things were going to be hell for I dug up gravel and went back into my hometown. It felt good to be back where I belong. I proceeded to spend the rest of the day chopping down wood. I decided against using regular wood for my evil lair because it fit right in with the village. It would have felt too native, too normal. It wouldn't scream evil. I decided to use crimson wood because it would look more evil and menacing. It was red and purple, clearly the colors of evil. As such, I invested a good portion of the next few days harvesting building materials for the evil lair. Because what's the point of being evil if you aren't also being extra as fuck? I made sure to destroy this villager's house because it was in the way of my girl boss headquarters. The nitwit continued to rebel against me, glaring at me, taunting at me. I made sure to increase my priority in dealing with him as his courage to stand up against me could lead to a potential revolution later down the line. For now, I decided to steal the crops from the village. This will dampen their spirits to fight back. And this will be useful for the villager reader later. Day 10 started with me killing the pigs. I was in the nether for a while. Pigs 
began to look like piglins. I sheared two of the sheep after breeding them, but after a quick Google search, I discovered that shearing them could actually benefit them. So I needed to offset it with something even more cruel. So I killed both parents in front of their children for maximum trauma. I then destroyed the house because it was in the way of my evil lair construction. I found out it was the Nitwit's house. It brings me great pleasure knowing that I'm sending a message to my loudest opposition so far. The Nitwit wasn't too happy about his house being destroyed. I promptly told him L didn't ask and watched as he fucked off, devastated by that ratio. As I went back into the nether to gather more building materials, I found out that villagers were also going through the portal. They could not handle the starvation and attempted to end their lives in the nether, which is a problem. I can't torture them if they are dead. A lot of the villagers were escaping before I could enslave them. So I spent the rest of day 11 blocking off entrances and keeping the village closed. I continued building my evil lair. I even made sure to create a floor plan of the evil lair. Yeah, that's how extra I am as an evildoer. Remember, the difference between a villain and a super villain is presentation. You can never fuck up presentation if you are super extra. The nitwit must have sensed that things were only going to get worse. He began to plot with the leather worker in secret to take back control of the village. Unfortunately, I was perceptive and I noticed this. I evicted his accomplice away from his dream job of a leather worker and enslaved him as my first slave, a librarian. On day 16, I made a trade with the mason. Some clay I stole from his house in exchange for one emerald and his house. I woke up the next day to the mason complaining about my unfair trade that I made yesterday and how the mason was forced to sleep in the cleric's house instead. I promptly asked them how their blood would look like on the blood red netherwart floor and watched as they fucked off knowing their place. Unfortunately, being the magnificent villain I was, was starting to cost more than I could handle. So I made a massive expansion of my drug cartel, and then explored the cave, mining resources required to gaslight the villagers later. I explored so deep in the cave that I lost signal with my recording software. And by that I mean I lost footage because OBS bugged out. But worry not, for I am an artist. I may be evil, but history has proven that evil people are good with art. Just ask Hitler. I collected chains from the exposed mine shafts, found an amethyst geode, and also three diamonds to make a diamond pickaxe. I started off day 20 making a full armor set and ventured back into the cave to look for two more diamonds. I went back to the amethyst geode I found earlier. See, I wasn't lying when I said I found one. I may be evil, but I'm not evil enough to lie to the viewer. Yet. I found glow squids, the best mob from the 2020 mob vault. I am objectively correct, but I don't care enough to prove it. I went blind to the very obvious diamond ore to mine the less obvious diamond ore deeper in the water. Now that I am financially independent as a girl boss, I could more efficiently be evil. I went back into the nether and tested out these more painful weapons on the piglins and hoplins, and continued my deforestation of the crimson forest for more nastier nether climate change. With my inventories full of building materials, I got to building my evil lair. I woke up and noticed something missing, or rather, some people. More and more villagers were escaping the village, the more progress I made on the evil lair's construction. A village with no villagers is a village that can't be enslaved. Perhaps this was the Nitwit's plan all along. He asked his fellow villagers to escape and seek refuge elsewhere. I would be unable to torture an empty village and would leave their village, and thus free the village from my ruling. I wasn't going to let him win. I'm not just evil, I'm evil and a genius. So I trapped two villagers in a house with piss yellow beds and forced them to repopulate the village. With one baby villager delivered the next day, I decided to begin on my villager breed.
By day 29, the nitwit began to panic. He realized that his plans to drive me away from the village wasn't working. In his desperation to foil my plans by destroying the farmland, he fell for my most powerful trap, the boat. Knowing full well that these two slave villagers shared the same parents, I made them repopulate the village with optimal incest. With the villager breeder completed, it was time for the nitwit's public torture. Who better to use as an example of what happens if you defy a tyrant like me than the leader of the revolution? In the center of my evil lair, I created a fence box and place campfires at the bottom. I then sentence the nitwit to stand in the roaster for the rest of their lives. You stand in there and think about what you've done after gaslighting the nitwit into thinking it was his fault for forcing a generation of slavery. I used the remaining iron I had to create iron bars for jail cells. The beds of the villagers needed to be grey. Grey gives jail feel. I didn't want the villagers to feel like they had human rights. I made Slave Tree as the first jailee. Where do you think you're going? Did I say you can leave? I killed him for jailbreaking and made sure Slave foresaw everything. So he knew what would happen if he were to attempt the same shit Slave Tree did. Your girl boss was starting to run low on iron, which meant it was time for an iron farm. It fitted perfectly into my plans, seeing as iron farms would include villagers being stripped of their human rights. With the supply of iron, I finished the jail cells. I can now be efficiently evil to the villagers. But I woke up on day 44 feeling guilty. I felt that I was being too cruel to these villagers. I felt regret at how bad of a lifestyle I was giving the inmates and sought out to try and rectify them. So I made sure the jail cells had an iron bar window for them to get some sun. They should be thankful I allow them to see the outside world. They should be thankful I allow them to see grass they shall never touch. The villager breeder was beginning to get crowded. Slaves were being produced at a faster rate than I can assign torture to. So I gathered Slave 9, Slave 10, and Slave 12, starving them. I then forced Slave 11 to become an armorer. He wasn't too happy about how I've been treating this village. He wanted to boycott me, and thus he charged his armor at higher prices. I could have killed him right then and there, but I had a better idea. As punishment, he would be spending his time in jail without a bed. He was forced to sleep on a netherwart floor, forced to cry onto the blood red floor. The Iron Golem wasn't too happy about me trying to starve people. Not my fault they can't handle my decision as a girl boss. Just don't starve, Lamau. I tried to kill it, but made my pillar two blocks high and got myself killed. Unluckily for the villagers, I remembered the coordinates of their village. On the way back, I found a swamp and a pillager outpost. Both environments I would not have found if it were not for the golem. So I had the heroic iron golem to thank for allowing me to torture the villagers more efficiently in the future. I guess you can say, what kills you makes you stronger. I made it back to the evil air and made a red bed. Because red is an evil color and also because I like the classics. Feeling vengeful and full of anger, I woke up and chose violence for the next two days. Decided to take my anger out on these piglins and honglins.
keeping up with this streak of cruelty, I made my first torture device, the cock and ball torture chamber. I made Slave 13 the victim, but found out that the device wasn't displaying enough of the torture. Feeling angry at the lack of display of violence, I killed him, making sure he died cockless and a virgin, with Slave 14 as my new victim. The 49th day started with me expanding the netherwart floor. It is now an evil foyer surrounding the cock and ball torture chamber. The iron golem wasn't too happy about me giving Slave 14 a painful vasectomy and tried to be the hero like the iron golem before him but he was too late this villager has his sex life cut off the iron golem died knowing that this villager is now forced into a life of being pegged I temporarily freed the three villagers after starving them for six days with no results and went back to building my sheep farm. You may be wondering why I'm building four separate sections for the sheep farm. This was so that I could breed the sheep and then separate the parents and keep the baby with one of his parents, wait for it to grow up and then breed them again for optimal incest. I then moved Slave 11 into their life imprisonment as well and destroyed another house I legally stole the rights to to make space for another torture device. This was the classic trap, the pressure plates and pistons. A trap that works so well, it immediately catches slave number 10 as a victim. It immediately catches slave number 9 as a victim as well. With their freedom stripped from all three of them, I got inspiration for another torture device. After spending a full day building it, I forced slave number 17 as a test subject into the device. This torture device almost drowns its victims. It would dispense water until they were out of breath and then let them breathe again before attempting to drown them again. However, the redstone clock malfunctioned and slave 17 died drowning. Oh no! Anyways, I then spent the rest of the day rebuilding the device with a different design, making sure it would start and stop drowning them correctly. I then forced Slave 18 into the device in the morning of day 55 and began to calibrate the delays. I kept adding a delay until he would begin to drown. While he was drowning half a heart every cycle, I got another fresh inspiration for another torture device. I made sure to start working on it while the evil inspiration was fresh. Completely unfaithful murder, I went on to finish my next torture chamber, a lava pit. Meanwhile, Slave 18 drowned to death when I wasn't looking. Ah good, I can write this off as a business expense. I still decided to calibrate the device one tick less. Not because I don't want the villagers to die. I just didn't want to keep breaking the glass in order to replace the victim. The value of their lives are worth less than two blocks of glass. I released Slave 20 with the intention of leading them into the lava pit, but he was very obedient and immediately resigned to his fate. I fulfilled his request for a The Floor is Lava Super Hard move. But that wasn't my request. It is now. I am now gaslighting you to thinking that was your request. I made the sheep perform optimal incest and led their unholy love child into a separate section of the farm. I led Slave 21 as the third victim of the drowning machine, but I made sure he didn't actually drown this time. I woke up to day 58 harvesting wool the evil way after optimal incest, then ventured out into the forest to get inspiration for newer torture methods. I found these two chickens in the forest, inspiration struck and I led them back to the evil lair. Leading the chickens into this hopper system, this torture device would collect eggs from the chickens and shoot them at the villager immediately. However, upon forcing Slave 22 into the device, I found out it wasn't hitting the villager at all. The eggs just went past him. I had to test if it was too close to hit this target, so I used arrows and concluded it was indeed too close to hit his victims. So I rebuilt it two blocks apart instead of one and tested it again with arrows, which worked perfectly as intended. I went to bed leaving him wounded. My evil lair was coming along great, but I needed to stick out more. And as such, I began working on my second floor. This finally blocked sunlight from reaching the inmates, giving them the true imprisonment view I wanted to give them. I also took the time to buy four swords of looting one from the first weaponsmith to make a diamond sword with looting tree. This will be needed when I raid the nether fortress later. I also traded with the armorer after sleeping on the floor for 17 days. 
he lost the will to be rebellious and began charging me normal prices like he should. With a full set of diamond armor, I continued my construction of the evil lair. With my second floor coming along well, I finally gave the evil lair the flare it needed. A wall of flowing lava. Nothing screams evil lair and villain headquarters like streams of lava coming down from the walls. However, I needed a new source for lava as the lava pit nearby was empty. So I ventured towards the forest again. I spent the day genociding everything in my path while I continued my search for a lava source. Continuing this kill streak of pillagers, I took this opportunity to also kill their prisoners. What are you doing? <laughs> you think you can just punch your way out of this? I, I know, know where your family is. lives. With their prisoners slaughtered, the pillagers no longer have any leverage over us. As I returned to my evil lair, the pillagers weren't too happy about me genociding their comrades. They wanted to seize control over this village. I spent the rest of day 65 and 66 negotiating with the pillagers. Trying to avenge the fallen, they lost even more lives trying to negotiate with a tyrant like me. If anything, I was made even more powerful with this raid. I got a totem of undying now. I spent the night in the swamp, collecting slimes for future torture devices. Genociding the pillagers has given me fresh inspiration for new torture devices, and I intend to make those ideas come true. I finished the lava walls, and the evil air is starting to look straight out of a superhero movie. Exactly the aesthetic I was going for. Things were starting to look up. Well, for me of course. The villagers, not so much. I grabbed stacks of redstone, some iron and copper, and prepared to make the villagers' lives even more miserable. While waiting for the child villagers to grow up to be amazing adult torture victims, I began building my torture devices. I then performed child murder on Slave 23. This really soured my reputation in the village, and iron golems began to attack me automatically. Somehow they're fine with slavery, torture, abuse, incest, war crimes, but they draw the line at child murder. Listen, adults are just bigger children. There's no distinction here. I built the third trap while I waited for the children to become bigger children, avoiding the hostile iron golems who were hunting me down. But worry not, for I am still an artist and I will still make use of this. I ventured straight into each direction to find the nether fortress. Venturing north, I found the Soul Sand Valley. I left before the souls of all that I've tortured and killed would haunt me. I ventured south and found an ancient nether civilization. I fed them lies and watched as they fell into a civil war that ended in a nuclear arms race. I ventured into the west and found myself in a different game. I finally ventured east and found a nether fortress. I needed gold nuggets, blaze rods, with the skeleton skulls. And what I did in there went against the Geneva Convention. After getting out of the nether, I got myself a brand new set of diamond armor from the armor. Now that OBS didn't bug out, I can finally demonstrate the torture devices. The first was the dildo trap. It would stick this copper rod up into the villager. Apparently, he liked it up front and center rather than down and behind. The second trap was an infinite trampoline set to launch the villager high up and almost out of the tube before letting them fall back down into the launcher again. I enchanted my pickaxe with silk touch for more efficient stealing. I needed to name it something that villains do all the time. So I named it Tax Evasion. I then finished my third torture device. It was more psychological than physical. I lured two zombies holding carrots into both ends of the trap and watched as Slave 27 was forced into an infinite loop of running away from zombies. 
I woke up in day 80, passed through my knee breaker, dildoinator, and cock and ball torturer. I began brewing splash potion of poison. These potions acted as loyalty programs along with the axe. I poisoned every villager to half a heart and made them too fragile and too weak to rebel against me, forcing them to work for me. I then harvested cobwebs from the spider spawn. It was my final idea of a torture device. Whoever was the victim will have their psyche destroyed permanently. Their sanity drained for good. This is gonna be my magnum opus of torture. I started building this device in the middle of the torture foyer. This masterpiece needed to be displayed in front of everyone. I created a stack of cobwebs with a water column elevator next to it. Made a leaf staircase up to the top to prevent iron golems from spawning. I did not want this glorious opening of this torture device to be interrupted. The 83rd day was spent luring my unlucky victim up to the top of the column. But upon reaching the top, he realized the torture he was about to be sentenced to and attempted to kill himself by a zombie. After his failed suicide, I threw him into a fate worse than death, forced to slowly slide down this stack of cobwebs with no way of escaping and then be feared by the zombie, entering the water column, pushing him back to the top, into the stack of cobwebs again. I, I shed a tear, knowing that I could never out-torture this magnum opus of a device I've made. It was day 84. The torture foyer was looking very well, but my evil lair was missing a final element. It needed to be seen from afar. It needed to instantly dampen the spirits of anyone who can see it. It needed to look menacing and evil. It needed to glow at night to be more noticeable. And it needed to terrorize the village even more. I intend to solve all of this with a mob farm. As my mob farm was complete, I realized that I didn't really need a supply for mending enchantments anymore. I extended a pillar to the house of the librarian and tied up loose ends. I began preparations to go into the air, but I needed to cover up my atrocities from human rights activists who may come and rescue the villages while I'm away. So I made posters and paintings of Yai Miko and pasted them over the torture devices, then went back into the nether to hunt for food. I got myself cornered while hunting and died, losing my totem of undying, but more importantly, I lost my tax evasion. I now have to pay my taxes like everyone does. I wanted to see a progress check of my 89 days so far. So with my artistic villainy skills, I sketched the map of the evil lair and the evil foyer. I was in tears, seeing the massive purple and red that I've plastered all over what used to be the village. I was in shambles. I realized that despite my atrocities, I could never truly be the most evil entity in this world. If I have not killed the ender dragon, the CEO of racism, before setting out to fight the Ender Dragon, I checked up on the librarian who I tied up loose ends with, who was very much dead. Karba was starting to catch up to me. Even the eyes of Enders refused to help me. They didn't even lead me to the stronghold before going static. With replacement tax evasion policies, I kept digging down. I found myself next to a zombie spawner, which gave me an enchanted golden apple. However, there were still no portal rooms in sight, using my enhanced evil hearings. I found the portal room through mere sounds. 
making sure to not repeat the mistakes of my previous Minecraft challenge. I dive headfirst into the end, and I met the number one villain in this world, the Ender Dragon. The Ender Dragon terrorizes these black Endermen. He runs into them recklessly just to harm them, making sure to anger as many of these black Endermen just by existing. What an inspiration to evildoers all across the globe. I strive to be as racist as the Ender Dragon. I started building a canopy as a safe zone in case the Endermen tried cancelling me for being racist. His number one title was going to be mine today, for the Ender Dragon can't be the number one most evil and most racist life form if it was dead. I am now officially the most evil, most racist person in the Minecraft world. It appears the solution to racism was violence after all. I needed to show the Enderman that the end being in my control was 10 times worse than the Ender Dragon's control. Upon reaching my evil lair, I made the dragon egg into an omelette, forcing the ender dragons into extinction. I still had one more day left before it's day 100. I needed to end this playthrough with a bang. I needed to end this in a way that allowed me to call this a genocide run. And I had just the idea for that. that my racist crimes have caught up to me and I was about to die to the widow as my eyes began to close against my will. As I returned to the darkest pits of hell where I belong, a cheeky green plastered on my face, I have left the villagers with someone, no, something even worse. Thank you, thank you, Titan has freed us! Oh, I wouldn't say free, more like under new management. But that was an adventure. Speaking of an adventure, have you ever wondered what it would be like if The Legend of Zelda took place in ancient Egypt? Check out this video next!